Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You are so brave. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I left my house a uh, little bit, uh, what time was, I don't, it doesn't matter, a little before nine, and um, it was perfectly nice. <laughs> By the time I got to the church, it was blowing and lightning was, I was like, goodness, it's, it's only like a mile away, but uh, I hope that you all uh, did okay. With that, obviously you're here, so you, you made it. Good for you. Uh, and we start, what does everybody say? Let's all say it together. We really need it. So we need the rain, so makes it, makes it fine. Um, just a couple of, of announcements. Uh, Bible study this Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall. And um, prayer ministry on the back here to, be, uh, to request prayers, a phone number and all that. But the most important announcement has to do with upcoming weekend. And so, Laurie, here you are. Come on up. Tell us all about it. Here it's in your the colorful flyer. Sounds great. If the contingency is if it rains, we will be in the fellowship hall and our Sunday school rooms and any place we can use the student building and all that. We're praying for lovely weather like that today. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. Any other announcements? All right. Well, we welcome our guests and visitors today. We're glad that you could be here. Every Sunday we have uh, visitors. Uh, joining us for worship, and it's a real privilege uh, for you to, to share and worship here, uh, for us to share and worship with you. So um, welcome, welcome. And now let us uh, turn, yes, Bob. Oh, yep, sorry. Come on up. Okay. If I can get this off from my glasses. Wow. If you wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah, there we go. This is obviously the second most important announcement. <laughs> Did you know that this is Holy Humor Sunday? <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? Seriously, it is. It uh, started in the uh, Greek church a long time ago, and uh, it's held here and there across the country. And uh, what it is essentially is it's, uh, it's a Sunday of joy and laughing and, and happiness because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I think the other term for it is Bright Sunday, but it's Holy Humor Sunday. Google it, you'll find out. In fact, there, there was a, a pastor uh, uh, over on uh, the Tampa side of uh, our state, and, uh, and on Holy Humor Sunday, he w got up and he said, I'm going to preach about sin. And even with mask on, I can see people going, oh boy, you know, <laughs> I'm going to preach about sin. And then he said, don't do it. And he sat down and that was it. <laughs> not, not that you should do that, George. Here's an idea. <laughs> anyway, these brochures have been handed out last week and this week. And it's something that's been in the work for a number of years here. And that is the fact that we're finally at a point where we're going to adopt uh, an endowment fund. And uh, an endowment fund is, I like to look at it as an investment of longevity, if you will. Uh, it's our legacy to First Presbyterian Church. And the brochure is quite self-explanatory. But I just thought I'd make a, a couple of comments regarding that. Um, the income and growth from an endowment fund is for non-budgeted expenses. 
In other words, um, uh, different programs, special programs of the church, uh, projects, uh, community projects, uh, different things that uh, education, uh, different programs that are not typically budgeted in that manner. And there's many different ways to give. Um, you can give uh, stocks and bonds. You can give real estate. Um, there's cash, life insurance, wills, trusts, uh, all different means of giving to this fund. And there is no such a thing as too little, and there's no such a thing as too much. So you can, uh, you can give uh, uh, to this fund that, that we are starting, and your gift will never go away. And what I mean by that is that it will always be remembered because the principal is never expended. Only the income is expended. And so this fund will grow over a period of time. And we have a number of commitments already, I'm, I'm fortunate to say. Um, I want to explain essentially very briefly how this growth can happen. Um, the church that I belong to up north, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. This is my church now, but that was my church up there. And that church, it was a relatively small church, smaller than this church, and that's a very moderate income community up there. It's way up, it's on the Canadian border. And we have about 14,000 people. And a number of years ago, 30 years ago to be exact, $5,000 was given to this fund, and that was the start. Today, that fund in that community is worth $2.5 million. And that is incredible growth, but it took 30 years to get there. And so I just uh, wanted to bring this forward. Please read this. I'm more than willing to talk to you at any time about it if, if you have some interest. Um, I, I hope you do. Um, call me anytime. My number is in this brochure. And um, maybe not at 2 o'clock in the morning, but otherwise, <laughs> call me. And I'd be more than happy to spend any amount of time that's necessary. I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and the church thanks you. And George, back to you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, let us turn our thoughts and our hearts over to God, and let us begin our time of worship.
we stand? The Lord be with you. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and who was and who is to come. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Let us worship God. Please be seated. Let us now confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Before I start singing, I'd like to say a couple of words. Um, this was written by Ian Bartlett all the way back in 1939, which is when my husband was born, so I can remember that. <laughs> and um, he was a very famous Christian singer and um, songwriter, but he wrote in shape notes, which means they had no staff, no key, keys. You could sing it almost any way you wanted to. And then it was a, this one was arranged by Ron Huff, and uh, so he added the staff and stuff. Um, but anyway, that's all I wanted to say. And uh, so I'm going to sing Victory in Jesus. <laughs>
so much. We uh, turn in our scripture today to the Gospel of John, and there we find Jesus appearing to his disciples, beginning with the 19th verse. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Then we turn to um, 1 Peter, very early in the book. <clears throat> First ch chapter, third verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through re re though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And then finally, just a single verse in Proverbs, the 17th chapter. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's turn to God for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. So the church went through a big renovation. They went into the sanctuary and they were going to make it into the absolute perfect sanctuary for the worship of God. But it was one of those churches where everybody came early to get the back seat, you know, not, not in this church. We're, we're okay with that. But, but other churches, they get there early and they, they start filling up from the very back and the preacher stands up. There's nobody up there in front because nobody wants to sit in the front. So he had plans drawn up. That when you came in the church and it was all finished, everybody was looking forward to seeing it, and they'd, they'd uh, uh, kept all the details kind of hidden and all that. And they all showed up that Sunday morning, and they walked into the church, and there was only one pew. And it was at the very back of the church, right there by the door, back where Frank likes to sit, back there. And, 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 but what happened is you came in, and you sat down, and an usher pushed a button, and it moved forward. <laughs> And another new pew popped up. Yeah. So they filled up the whole church like this. 
preacher thought it was great. This is, this is awesome. I mean, he's right here in front of us. So he's preaching. He's going on and on and on. And, and uh, you know, he didn't get the short message uh, uh, to, to keep it simple. And, and, and just as the time for worship was supposed to be over, you know, that it, in the South, that would be noon because everybody goes to church at 11 o'clock. But we, we do it at 10. So at 11 o'clock, one of the ushers goes to the back and pushes a button, and the pulpit sinks into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Church is a funny, is a funny place. And, and these two guys were, were arguing. They were just talking about, well, you know, I, when I grew up, I went to church. And oh, no, you didn't go to church. Yeah, I did. I went to church. Did you go to church? Yeah, I went to church. No, you didn't. And they just they kept bragging on each other. And one of them said, I remember so fondly going to church. And the guy said, well, prove it. He said, well, um, what if I recited the Lord's Prayer? He said, okay, let's see if you can do it, because I bet you five bucks you can't recite the Lord's Prayer. And he said, put his head down, and he said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the <laughs> United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The other man took out his wallet, gave him five bucks, and said, I bet anything you didn't know it. But you, <laughs> but you did. Yeah. This is, oh, I, listen, I got a million of them. This is, uh, is Ho Holy Humor Sunday. Um, this, is, this is kind of a big deal. It did start with the, well, the, the Orthodox Church. And it was a way to recognize that we are people of joy, that we have good news. Jesus was resurrected. Uh, now, uh, that, there is no greater news than that for us. So why do we come to church? Uh, well. I don't know, maybe with long faces and such. I, I, I don't understand it. But the, the priests and the ministers would get together in town on the Monday after Easter. and They'd put their feet up onto coffee tables and they would smoke cigars and, and drink uh, uh, brandy, at, uh, which I've been trying to get to Presbytery to get them to do that. <laughs> they, they don't, they don't, they don't want to do it. But, but it's, it's uh, 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 the church's way of laughing at the devil. Remember, the devil thought that everything was done. He won. Jesus is dead. Woo! And there must have been a party in hell, the likes of which. And then you know, what? He's alive. What? He's al And the church people rejoiced. And they laughed. They laughed at the powers of death, the powers of evil, the powers of the devil. All of that, they laughed because the joke was on them. The resurrection is a comedy of the best sort, an unexpected reversal of expectations. Mary comes to the tomb Easter morning, expecting to find a dead body there. Her train of thought keeps barreling along that one track. She's almost literally stumbles over a man who is the risen Lord. This is humor of the highest order. Resurrection reverses the expectation of gloom and, and, and doom in the face of death and instead brings celebration. It's party time. In fact, many churches hand out horns and bells on the, for Easter Sunday and for Sundays afterwards. And every time you feel like you're celebrating, you should ring your bell. We would have, when you finished your, your song, we would have ringing bells and, and, and blowing on horns. Doesn't that sound like church? No, it really doesn't, does it? Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. <laughs> seriously, seriously. I knew a pastor in a church in Atlanta. He was retired by the time that, that I was there, but, but he was legendary. He would go fishing with some of his parishioners, and he wore a, whole, a suit, three-piece suit, to go fishing because he's the pastor. And I remember standing at a Red Food Stores in Chattanooga. I wasn't ordained. I was still in seminary. And uh, many of you know that for me, the greatest thing about COVID is that I get to wear shorts all the time. I, don't, I do not like long pants. I, I just, you know, no, don't, don't like them. So I'm standing in Red Food Store, and the pastor's wife from another church, she knew me and I knew her. And she said, well, you know that once you get ordained, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. I almost changed my mind. I was like, what? I can't. Because in her mind, you had to be formal. You had to be dressed up all the time. Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we come into church and we act the way that we do? I will tell you, 
Robert, Robert Louis Stevenson once entered in his diary as if he was recording some extraordinary phenomenon. He wrote this, I have been to church today and I am not depressed. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, amazing. How many Christians does it take to screw in a light bulb? Hmm? Well, if you're charismatic, only one. You already got both hands in the air. <laughs> All right, if you're Lutheran, at least 15. One to change the light bulb and three committees to approve the change and decide who brings the red uh, jello. You know, you get that. Red jello. Catholic, none. Candles, only candles. Episcopalians, eight. One to call the electrician and seven to say how much better they like the old light. <laughs> and finally, Presbyterians, change? My grandmother gave that light bulb. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we can laugh at ourselves. One, after a, a baptism of his baby brother in church, a little boy named Johnny was sobbing all the way home in the backseat of the car, and the dad wanted to know what was going on with him and, and, and asked him three times what was wrong. And finally, the little boy said, the preacher said that he wanted us to be brought up in a Christian home, but I wanted to stay with you. <laughs> Tom Mullen, who's a, a modern theologian of laughter, wrote a book with an int int uh, intriguing title called Seriously, Life is a Laughing Matter. He takes on a common vision of religion as restrictive and punitive and dour and implies that Christian faith is like going to the dentist. If it's going to be good for us, it's supposed to hurt. Tom disagrees, and so do I. One scripture lesson does it says it to us. Listen again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials greatly rejoice there are trials i mean look what uh, this past year the tremendous trials that we've had with covid many of you lost friends or you know of people that were in your community or communities up north that it, you, they died i mean but what a tremendous trial i uh, did any of you like wearing a mask no, nobody, nobody does. I don't know. Bill Zayat does because he said, you know, he, he likes to uh, hide his face. You know, now, but any of you, anybody? No, no, we don't. Or maybe the trials might be personal and private. Maybe jobs will disappear. Maybe children will disappoint. Maybe families will fail. But the Word of God says those trials are not the last word. No matter what you've gone through, that's not the end of the story. So do you know what this means? Do you know what the end of the story is? Salvation. Salvation. Lots of people do not know what it means. It's a churchy word that we throw around all the time, misunderstood, like pie in the sky, by and by. One day, you know, salvation, it equals some sort of a, a religious fire insurance, but not really. Salvation is so much more than that. The word comes to us from Latin, meaning salus, which it has nothing to do with life after death. Listen to what I said. Salus has nothing to do with life after death. It means health. It means wholeness. And a very similar meaning in the Hebrew word shalom, which folks oversimplify by meaning peace because it's so easy to understand that, but it too carries the idea of wholeness. But it is wholeness that begins now. Your salvation, that wholeness, that togetherness begins now. Why don't you act like it? Study after study insists that a positive mental outlook, an optimistic view of the future is critical to mental health and wholeness. Salvation, essentially. And what this means for you and me, salvation has already begun. We can have all of the confidence, all the optimism anyone could ever need because we know how the story finally ends. Not with the, uh, the whine of missiles or the whimper of war-ravaged children, but with tidings of great joy first heard over Bethlehem and the hallelujah chorus sung by hosts of heaven. Rejoice! 
rejoice. We all have reasons to rejoice in this world and in the next. We know how this ends. I like the way the lesson closes. Though we have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving, present tense, you are receiving the goal of your faith. And what is that? Salvation for your souls. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, maybe we Christians can be a little bit, oh, I don't know, odd, a little funny. We love someone that we've never seen. We daily speak to someone that we do not hear aloud. We are strongest when we are weak. We are richest when we are poor. We die so that we might live and give away so that we can keep. We see the invisible. We hear the inaudible and know that which is beyond knowledge. Christians, yeah, we're strange. But we just know the end of the story. And that makes all the difference. Because the ending is so good. It's so good, it is great. And now humor has been a part of our faith tradition from the very beginning. There's some wonderful comedy in the Old Testament. If you just look at it correctly, there's that wild and wacky story of Jonah who uses humor to skewer Israel's temptation to tell God who will and who will not be saved. There's that beautiful little memoir of Ruth that attacks Israel's racism by subtly reminding them that their great-grandmother of their greatest king was a person from another race. The New Testament has a lot of fun stuff, too, if we would just read it properly. Jesus' illustration of someone trying to call attention to a tiny speck in a neighbor's eye while a whole log is hanging out of his own eye is one of those. Elton Trueblood wrote a book entitled The Humor of Christ, which was inspired by that phrase. He says, the germ of the idea which, was finally, which has finally led to the writing of this book was planted many years ago when our eldest son was four years old. We were reading to him from the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, feeling very serious. And then suddenly the little boy began to laugh. And he laughed because he saw how preposterous it would be for a man to be so deeply concerned about a speck in another person's eye that he was unconscious to the fact his own eye had a beam in it. Because the child understood perfectly that the human eye is not large enough to have a beam in it. And the very idea just struck the little boy as ludicrous. His laughter was a rebuke to his parents for their failure to respond to humor in unexpected places. The Bible has so much in it that is funny. It, did you all notice the, the covers? I, I, I pick these covers out every week. I just I enjoy it. It's one of the things I really enjoy. Yeah. Google smiling Christ. Try to just try to find Pictures where Jesus is smiling. There's not a lot of them out there. Somehow the church has gotten the idea that Jesus never smiled. By the way, he, he wasn't white either. So if you all want to, if you all want to debate me on that, don't, uh, because you'll lose. But you know, in our in our minds, we we have Jesus as dour and sour and and just unhappy. I've always thought that Jesus must have been someone who was fun to be around. Not some unsmiling, serious, quote, religious type of person. And do you know why I feel like that? Because kids loved him. Every time that there were children around, they were attracted to him. And I've never met anybody who attracted children who was grim and sullen and glum. True but blood wrote again. Anyone who reads the Synoptic Gospels with a relative freedom from presuppositions pre might be expected to see that Christ laughed and that he expected others to laugh. But our capacity to miss th this aspect of his life is phenomenal. We are so sure that he was always deadly serious that we often twist his words in order to try to make them conform to our preconceived mold. A misguided piety has made us fear that acceptance of his obvious wit and humor would somehow be mildly blasphemous or sacrilegious. Religion, we think, is serious business, and serious business is incompatible with friendly, humorous banter. Any of you uh, like uh, Sean Connery, who recently passed? Yeah, Sean, Sean Connery, um, he did die, didn't he? Recently? Yeah, I thought so. And that was besides the point, but it just hit me. Uh, one of the movies that I loved that he made was called The Name of the Rose. 
it's a great a movie about monks back in the Middle uh, Ages, and uh, it's, it's a uh, murder mystery, and it's, it's great. But the abbot of the, uh, uh, of the monastery where he is coming to try and figure out who the murderer is, he is a dour, sour old man, just crotchety to the end. And he said the most interesting phrase in, in that movie that struck me, and he was absolutely serious, that a praying lips do not belong on a smiling face. And he was serious. And he, he forbid the, the monks to laugh or to do anything else that was fun. Can you imagine that? Yeah, you can because you've been hearing it from pulpits for as long as I know. I, I'm, I don't know too many pastors that are, that are too much fun. Uh, I get in trouble for that. I will, I'll tell you one time I, I, I mentioned um, about uh, that lady at, at Red Food Stores. But I was in one of my early churches, and I had just started up in, in Columbia. And one of the elders who became a, a, a good friend, I, I buried his wife. I was in the room when she passed away. He had a terrible stroke, and I helped him do it with his rehab and, and other things. A really nice guy. But he came to me. He was chairman of worship. And he said, hey, you're doing great. Love, loving what you're doing. But you need to back off of the humor a little bit. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you think it worked? No. Because I told him, I said, you know, I appreciate that, but I'm Popeye. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I am what I am. <laughs> he didn't appreciate that at the time. It's too bad, though. I mean, it's our loss. Even in matters of faith, perhaps especially in matters of faith, Proverbs tells us a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Isn't it terrible? Do you all, uh, now, it seems like everybody I'm talking about today has died, but uh, the late Robin Williams movie, Patch Adams, do you remember that? Yeah, been years ago. It's a wonderful, I watched it uh, again uh, about two weeks ago because of this, uh, this sermon. It's a, it, and it's a true story, so if you didn't remember that, but let me just go off back through it for a little bit. It's the story of a very compassionate but outrageous medical student who risked his career by defying the medical professions with his unwavering belief that laughter is both therapeutic and contagious. Inspired to become a doctor when he was in institutionalized uh, as a young man for depression, he attended the Medical College of Virginia. It was the late 60s and early 70s where he was criticized by his uh, official medical school record for excessive happiness. <laughs> Yeah, I was on my own too. And once told by a faculty advisor, if you want to be a clown, join the circus. And Patch did. In fact, he wanted to be a clown, but he also wanted to be a physician. So combining these two vastly different sides of his personality, he became both. And after graduation, he formed the Gesundheit Institute, dedicated to a more connected, personalized approach to medicine using unconventional methods and wacky surprises to ease patients' anxiety and to enhance their healing. He helped pioneer the idea that doctors should treat people, not diseases. He began receiving a flurry of uh, media attention about his unorthodox clinic in the mid-80s, despite resisting at first. He eventually wrote the book about the work upon which the, uh, the film was based in 1993 and explains his humor-driven prescription and why he was willing to dress like a gorilla, fill a room of, full of balloons or a tub full of noodles to elicit a smile, a spiritual connection, a simple moment of pleasure for a patient. I've always thought it strange and unfortunate that people think nothing of acting angry and grumpy, but are self-conscious about demonstrating positive feelings, he wrote. We all know how important love is, yet how often is it really emoted or exhibited? So what so many sick people in this world suffer from, loneliness, boredom, and fear, cannot be cured with a pill. We know about all those things now. We know about endorphins and the importance of the mind and the healing process. You go to any hospital and they bring in dogs to, to uh, visit with you and lots of wonderful things that they do. They're getting it now, but back at that time, it was revolutionary. Today, we understand that. But he was forming, when he was forming his philosophy, someone much further back than that knew a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. 
That is a reminder that we all need to hear from time. Life can become a burden. We can despair of ourselves and everything around us. We can be depressed and discouraged and despondent. We can get so far down that we cannot remember what up looks like. And then along comes a day, a day like today, a day for laughter and lightheartedness, for comedy and craziness, a day to celebrate the victory of the resurrection over death and the grave, a day to join our voices with God who sits in the heavens and laughs a day to remember the promise of jesus who said i came that you might have life and have it more abundantly let that roll over you for a little bit what does that mean to you does that mean that more i don't know um don't more stop more we had a lady in our church in auburndale who couldn't stand it because the children were in worship Oh, they made noise all the time. One of them was mine, so she knew she wasn't going to get anywhere with, with that. But she complained because the ushers, when they would come down the central aisle, the, the, uh, the, the women, would, their, their high heels would click on the, on the tile. And, and it bothered her. And I thought, why are you coming to worship? You're just bumming me out. I mean, you know, and she was a wonderful lady. She really was. But she just had these idiosyncrasy, idio, she was idiosyncratic. <laughs> I love that word. I'm going to work that into lots of conversations today. <laughs> Two women were discussing their pastor. One woman said, my pastor is so good he can talk on any subject for an hour. The other one said, well, that's nothing. My pastor can talk for an hour without saying anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. A four-year-old boy spilled his... Uh, Coke on a rug the other day and wanted to clean it up. A mess himself. He was told, okay, well, there's a mop right outside the door. You can go and, and get the mop and clean it up. And he looked out the door and it was dark. And he says, I don't, I don't really want to go out there. And, and mom said, well, don't worry about it. Jesus is with you wherever you go. So he goes to the back door and he opens and he says, Jesus, if you're back there, would you hand me the mop? <laughs> An old pastor I knew named Bob, who was known for always having bad puns at the tip of his tongue, once told me that as, <coughs> excuse me, as God's chosen people gather at the Lord's table, normally a reverent and solemn occasion, despite the fact that we say we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. And the liturgy begins, this is the joyful feast of the people of God, which I just think is hysterical. People would say that. Most often the church's ob observance when we do communion, when we, we do that, is uh, more like a, a funeral than a festival. Years ago, back in the days before Presbyterians welcomed young children to participate at the Lord's table. After the worship was over, the pastor prepared to leave the sanctuary and scooped up his three-year-old son, and they're walking out, and the little boy said, Daddy, Daddy, when will I be big enough to come to the party? Yeah. Here was a toddler who knew as well as anyone what was supposed to be going on. A celebration, a joyful feast. So John finds Peter, runs up to him, I'm incredibly excited. And he just says, Peter, 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 I have got the best news. Well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And Peter takes hold of John and calms him down and says, okay, okay, take it easy, take it easy. What's the good news? John says, the good news is Jesus is risen. He's alive. And Peter said, that is awesome. What's the bad news? John looks around and he says, well, he's really steamed about last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite one. <laughs> You've heard the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Somebody came up with a different version. It says, God grant me the senility to forget the people I never liked anyway. The good fortune to run into the ones that I do. And the eyesight to tell the difference. <laughs> so let the celebration begin. Friends. We are Easter people. God has given us the greatest good news of all time. When you can take off your masks, <laughs> let that show. Let it show in such a way, because I believe that the life of the church, what we do when we attract people to come here and to worship with us is because we smile, and we smile, and we joke, and we laugh. Even this morning, I, when I, I showed up, I, I had waited in my car for a while for the worst of the storm to go. And I came in, and you knew what they were doing in the back? They were laughing. They were joking around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wonder if anybody's going to come. I, well, I don't know. But it's it just, it was joy. 
joy because we know the story. Jesus is risen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, as I stumble through this life, help me to create more laughter than tears, dispense more happiness than gloom, spread more cheer than despair. Never let me become so indifferent that I will fail to see the wonder in the eyes of a child or the twinkle in the eyes of someone aged. Never let me forget that my total effort is to cheer people, make them happy, and forget, at least for the moment, all the unpleasant things in their lives. And Lord, in my final moment, may I hear you whisper, when you made my people smile, you made me smile. Amen. We, um, I have a, a prayer card up here. Uh, yeah, here it is. And this is, this is a delightful one. And uh, Lori, this, this is, should be for you. Wanda has asked us to uh, lift up the fellowship ladies. Um, they're all ladies, aren't they? We've got to change that because you know, somebody can mess stuff up there. Um, thank you for the Easter gifts. And what a nice surprise. That was last Sunday for Easter. They were handing out things. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. It's Frank, everybody. Give me a hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pay for that. Um, <clears throat> this is from Carolyn Peters for a family of Krista Smith, who died suddenly this week, and it was her niece. Uh, Carolyn, where, uh, where are you sitting? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Well, we'll keep her in our prayers. Krista Smith. Um, anyone else? Let's turn our thoughts over to God. How quickly, once Easter has passed, do we settle back into our everyday normal routines as if nothing has changed, oh Lord? We aren't really all that different from the early disciples, those who returned to their fishing nets and yet... Things are different, and we are surprised and delighted by the many ways that the resurrected Christ appears in our sacred, ordinary, daily lives. We meet Christ in the breaking of bread with our family and friends and even strangers. We meet Christ in our places of work, in our daily tasks and errands, in the little acts of love and support that come our way. We even meet Christ in those unlikely places like hospital waiting rooms, eyes of those who are homeless, in the rebellious struggles of teenagers in search of identity and our concern for single parents and children, in the quiet witness of all of our elderly. And yet, oh God, we're still reluctant to respond to that presence. It is still difficult to follow. It is still difficult to care for others the way that we know that we should. That Christ continually confronts us with the question, do you love me? And we say, yes, we love you. But too easily we settle back into a comfortable faith. You call us to discipleship, to feed the sheep of this world. But we continue to hold back. Living Christ, walk among us and teach us to walk with you. Energize us as you did those first disciples to reach out to one another in love and in mission. Make us instruments of your peace that we might give hope to those who are hopeless, strength to those that falter, love to those who are lonely, consolation to those who are grieving, and faith to those who lack faith. Teach us to live more daringly, more expectantly, more joyfully. Transform us with your spirit that we may honor the risen Christ in active discipleship to share the great good news, to share the end of the story with a world that is starving for that good news. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, don't, don't put that up, Tim, because no, I'm going to ask you when we finish the, would you play that again as we're sure. walking out? Just something, those of us want to hear it again. That was awesome. <laughs> I want to sing that song. That's great. Let's stand, please. When you go from this place, you take the risen Lord with you. The greatest good news that you can share with anyone. Do it. Do it. And smile and find the joy that is in every single day. And every single encounter can be something of joy for you to share and to take with you. So do that today. Oh, the Hasties are here. I wanted to say that for the prayer. We're glad we haven't seen you in a while. And we know that you've been feeling a little, little low. But uh, you look great. And it looks like you're glad to have you here today. Thank you. And truly, I'm glad to see all of you here today. Um, let's uh, now uh, close with the benediction. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Now may God, who has sent his Son into the world to save us from sin and reconcile us to himself, give us the desire and the strength to follow his Son today and throughout this week for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you.